When the stakes are good wages and precious jobs, sometimes union reformers end up dead on the floor. A possible motive, but perhaps not the only explanation for the killings of Jean Viernes, union dispatcher, and Silmi Domingo, union secretary treasurer. To their friends and union brothers, Domingo and Viernes are martyrs. Many believe they were gunned down for running the union by the book. No kickbacks, no sweetheart deals with the canners. I don't, I don't know, I think we're all sort of uh, in that extended period of shock for a while where you're sort of doing things and you're making sure that things are going right, but we weren't really, nobody took like time off and went away and grieved or didn't do what needed to be done in order to carry on the work of the union. You know, I think um, when people die over what you're doing, you, you, get, you get committed to, to make it happen. I would say that that period that we were in after the murders was kind of a resurgence of, um, of a democratic, progressive union within Local 37. I think the, you know, the measure of good leadership is that they train other people. And so I think when, you know, I think that that's what they underestimated when they killed Gene and Selmy. That they thought by killing Gene and Selmy that they were gonna kill the movement. And we had built we had built the reform movement. We had built a movement within the, within the union. And so we, they took them out, but they didn't stop the movement. Selmy Domingo and Jean Viernes, two names which are synonymous with Seattle Asian American activism and fish and cannery workers' rights. They were two men who, despite their differences in personality, were united in their dedication to community service and labor reform. You can ask for two more different people, but the, the one constant between the two of them was that they were very uh, dedicated to the cause of uh, reforming the union, uh, so that they, uh, they shared that uh, very strongly together. Selmy was uh, very more, more urban, very gregarious, uh, outgoing. Jean was, uh, you know, a country boy raised in, uh, in Wapato. Wapato, a small farming town in the Yakima Valley of central Washington. It is from this tight-knit agricultural community that Jean Viernes and other Filipino-American laborers traveled to Alaska to work in salmon canneries during the summer months. Yes, I did grow up in the Yakima Valley. Actually, I was born in Yakima, and uh, my folks lived in, uh, lived in the Lower Valley. They were farmers. And uh, had four brothers working on the farms. And at that time, during the 70s and even the, uh, during the 60s, the uh, employers of the Alaska seafood industry did a lot of recruiting down in these areas, Wapato, and also in the San Joaquin Valley in Stockton and Delano, California. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, lot of prospective uh, canning workers there because the employer knew that they, uh, they could do the grueling work that was necessary in the industry. Gene was the eldest sibling of nine, the first of his family to follow his father Felix Viernes up to Alaska in 1967. He was 15 years old. Friends remember him as down to earth and low key. Gene was more of a country guy and he didn't really care what he looked like. He'd wear this Levi jacket, he'd wear jeans, he'd have this white hat or what do they call painter's hat. He'd have that all the time and, he'd, and he would never wear a suit or tie. He would be really very casual all the time. A star wrestler and excellent student, Gene took an interest in history and enrolled in the recently established Ethnic Studies program at Central Washington State College. He had so many books, you know, he was always buying them and he amassed big libraries of it and, and he'd know it all, you know, of everything he read, he'd, he'd, he'd have it up there. It's, it's kind of different the way he was, he's, he, cause he could meet people and he'd have them figured out in no time flat. Within a few minutes, he's figured them out and he's already trying to help them correct what one of their problems. 
Smart and intuitive, he was also a natural leader. One thing he was, he was very persistent. I mean, he would just keep after things until he got them. And I mean, you know, one person's leader is another person's bossy person. <laughs> He, he was the kind of guy, we were working and they would say, I need someone to drive a jetney, and we didn't know how to drive a jetney. But he would raise his hand and say, I'll drive it. And, and then he had a new skill, and then he, he was always to, to go one more step. And so a lot of times he, he became the leader because he, he had that skill or he was willing to take that risk. Uh, Gene was very energetic, very forceful. He was a small package, but he was very forceful. You know, he knew what he wanted, what, you know, what needed to be done. And I'd fight him tooth and nail for <laughs> my share of the power. But, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, like I say, I, I really respected him. Um, it grew, at, you know, as, as he did things like head off to Alaska. And uh, he just became my idol, my, you know, my role model. Going off to work in the canneries in Alaska was a rite of passage for many of these Wapato boys. It wasn't just an opportunity to work, it was also a chance to connect to the past. Basically, Alaska was um, kind of a connection to our parents. You know, we were really aware of our, of our parents' you know, travels and journeys through life, you know, coming from the Philippines and working the, the migrant trails, and, and, and Alaska was part of that. As early as 1917, over 100 canneries in Alaska packed more than half the world's supply of canned salmon, a multi-million dollar industry that only continued to grow throughout the decades. Filipino seasonal workers competed for these back-breaking yet lucrative jobs, and their work ethic was passed on to their sons. Our forefathers actually got started working in, in, uh, in the Alaska seafood industry and then graduated up to the next generation, which I'm a second generation Filipino-American. And uh, it was pretty much a rite of passage in terms of going to work in the canneries. It was a rite of passage for those from the city too. Many Filipino-Alaskan cannery workers were from Seattle, and one of them was a charismatic young man named Silmi Domingo. Tell me was very much a big city guy, right? Tell me. <laughs> he scared the hell out of me. <laughs> he used to wear his, you know, his black coat, and he had that big black hat, and he had the high boots, and he was just kind of a tough guy. He had his hangouts, which I used to hang out with him, like the party, you know. It was almost infectious when you were around him that you would have a good time. Silmi was stylish and popular and he was keenly interested in the world around him. His charm transferred over to community activism. As a University of Washington student in 1971, he joined the growing community newspaper movement, which helped cement his commitment to social change. And as much as he was a guy with a kind of goofball sense of humor, he was very serious about getting done what he wanted to get done. In some ways, uh, Selmy was a bigger-than-life um, personality. Um, had a lot of friends, a lot of acquaintances. Uh, uh, came from a, a recognized uh, Alaskaero family. Filipino seasonal workers who traveled up to Alaska to work in the canneries were called Alaskeros. Selmy's father, Nemisio who hailed from Ilocos Sur province, was part of the first large wave of immigrants from the Philippines in the 1920s. Silmi and his older brother, Nemisio Jr., both became actively involved in the Local 37, the cannery workers' union their father's generation had helped establish. International Longshoremen's Warehouseman's Union. And uh, the Local 37 was, was the branch, the Seattle branch, but it was it consisted mostly of Filipinos, I think, over 90, 95 percent. It was the era when post-World War II generation Alaskeros were beginning to work alongside the elder generation. Younger Filipino Americans, like Jean and Silmi, began to realize that they shared a common history and that they needed to work together to fight for social change, despite their personal differences. But they were very um, similar in terms of their thinking, right? 
Salmi was really out there, just really social. And um, Gene was really quiet, very into his writings and very, um, you know, mild mannered. And um, it, it, they were very different, but the combination itself was dynamic. Their passion and determination for social change was to become part of a decades-old continuum of union activism around Alaska cannery workers and the Filipino community. First-generation Filipino men are often called manongs, a respectful Ilocano term meaning older brother. It was the manongs who led the first workers' rights struggles as part of Local 37. Their leaders included writer Carlos Belosan, author of the seminal novel America's in the Heart, and Chris Mansalvas' father, Chris Sr., the president of the Local 37 during a very turbulent time for labor unions. He was uh, president of Local 37 for I don't know how many years. As long as I've known my dad, he was always involved in, in union work. And the reason why he didn't go to the Philippines, what I heard is that he was told by some of his labor contacts in the Philippines that he would be assassinated as soon as he got to the Philippines. Within the local, there had been, you know, in the 50s, a number of the, the officers were brought up on un-American activities and were, they tried to deport them. At the same time, they were trying to deport the president of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, Harry Bridges. Founder and leader of the ILWU, Harry Bridges was one of the most important labor leaders of the era. The second generation Local 37 members were just starting to get an idea of the legacy of the struggles of their forefathers. Didn't really know anything about the union except that was the place we paid our dues and that's what kind of where we got dispatched. And I knew my dad was attorney for the union. He, he talked a number of times about Harry Bridges. My dad talking about Chris Monsalvas and Harry Bridges is sort of like very different people and very, from very different walks of life but who had a very significant impact on the West Coast labor movement. So there was a lot of political ties um, within the local. And, and so a lot of the early fights were around political struggles, political issues about which way the, the local should go. So Selmy, being very political himself, found that um, very interesting and really sought out the stories from the elders and the local. And Jean was uh, a very much a historian. So Jean did a lot of the research and, and, uh, on the lo in the local and just in his community, the link between Wapato and Seattle and the Alaska Cannery Workers Union. Terry Mast, a young woman from the Wallingford neighborhood in Seattle, had been a cook at a cannery and began working at the newly formed Alaska Cannery Workers Association a legal advocacy group created by the younger Alaskeros to challenge the discrimination against non-whites in the canneries. It was at the ACWA that many social causes banded together and where Terry met the dynamic activist Selmy. Yeah, I was definitely attracted to Selmy by the, the political work and his intellect. Um, you know, he was kind of a wild guy back then too, but so we all were. <laughs> This generation was coming of age in a time when socio-political unrest was happening nationally, internationally, and locally. I was sent to Vietnam, then came back wounded. And at the same time, I was sent to the Fort Leavenworth prison, and I was uh, facing a two and a half year um, sentence. It, is, it, it was there where uh, I was in contact with ex-Black Panther Party, and so I started reading Malcolm X. So that's where my eyes got open. And so when I came out of prison, I started going to Seattle Central Community College. And that's where I was uh, introduced with the Oriental Student Union at that time. And uh, began to get involved with the Asian movement. Activists organized rallies to support community housing, health services, diversity in higher education, fairness in the trades, and the impending construction of the kingdom a new sports arena that would displace residents and change the face of the International District, a mostly Asian populated neighborhood. Their efforts resulted in establishment of low-income housing, a health clinic, a neighborhood preservation plan, and equitable hiring practices. 
and many of these movements came together at the ACWA office on 8th Avenue South. Because there was a lot going on in the community at that time, I mean, there was all kinds of struggles going on. Uh, Community-based struggles, uh, civil rights struggles, the whole uh, integration of the building trades, the women in trades, the, you know, the office was, I would say, a kind of a hotbed of people who were working on and being uh, active in progressive political uh, pursuits. We were supported by UCWA, the Construction Workers Association. And then in turn, we supported other folks. We formed coalitions with other Asian groups. There was support of preserving the International District. There was support of the anti-martial law activities. Two months prior to the Kingdom protests, Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos had declared martial law on September 21, 1972. The Union of Democratic Filipinos, also known by its Tagalog acronym, the KDP, fought against the Marcos dictatorship and called for social change among Filipino Americans. The first time I met Selmy and Jean and Angel, all these guys, Terry, is in the context of uh, we're establishing a KDP chapter here in Seattle. Our, our commitment was to organize this community, this Filipino community here. So then, of course, the approach we took in KDP was uh, really to get to the, deep, the particular details of every Filipino community we're trying to organize. So, in Seattle, um, as soon as you start that review, you come up to the canneries <laughs> and the Alaska situation. The Alaska situation. Though grateful to be employed each season at the canneries, the Alaskeros were experiencing blatant discrimination due to race, a status quo that didn't sit well with this newly politicized generation of workers. When I was at the cannery, uh, we basically saw a lot of things that was uh, really quite disturbing, you know, things that you wouldn't think happened, uh, such as uh, uh, a segregated uh, bunkhouse, segregated jobs. You're stuck in certain jobs without any chance of promotion, and everything was segregated. You know, your your laundry, your mail, your where you lived, the type of food you had, and uh, you know the bunkhouse that, that housed the white workers had better food. When I go to Alaska, I saw the conditions being really bad. I got called a little brown boy, right, you know, to my face. Mm. I had to sleep in a room with eight people, you know. Um, I had to work 20 hours a day, you know, relative to growing up in a school where I was like, you know, like a, a wrestling uh, star or, you know, like a sports star or a scholastic uh, excel or something like that. Mm. I mean, you go there and you automatically stepped on. So, like, I would say things were bad now. now this is the... What? <laughs> The 1970s, my God, you know what I mean? It's like, that's why I meant it was like a flashback because you think we knew we had an organizing effort and that there was inequality, but personally, I was stunned. I thought I expected inequality, but you know, that it would be a little bit more subtle than this. This was just like straight out of a book. We'd been talking all summer because the Filipinos just got rice and meat and sometimes salmon heads. I mean, we would joke, but we were kind of serious that, God, we're getting scurvy or something, you know. For, for coffee breaks, us Filipinos were getting just black coffee and a little package of cookies to divide up a whole crew, you know. The, the white crew had vegetables, sandwiches, fruits, hot chocolate. I mean, just a banquet, table full of stuff. And we used to tell our foreman, how come they get all that and we don't? That's the way it is, you know, just... Be content. And we went to this warehouse and it had all this food because they were supplying the ships and supplying the white man's mess. And, and they had like fruit cocktail and peaches. And I mean, we never saw any of that. The Alaskeros who did the grueling jobs inside the fish houses often worked 18 or more hours a day at dangerous, repetitive tasks, barely pausing to eat and sleep. It was worsened by the terrible housing conditions and food. After one particularly hard day, Jean organized an impromptu food strike. We had just worked a long stretch, maybe three, four days. The way Alaska works is they have fishing and then the, the authorities closed down the fisheries for a few days to let some salmon through. So we just worked really a real long stretch, three or four days at 20 hours a day. And, so we're all really tired. And they had, we, we basically had a day where we could have a day off, but we were still under contract. And we were saying, we, 
we want some of that food. We know it's there, you know? And they said, no. So what they would have us do on these kind of days, rather than just let us relax in our barracks, they had us, um, they'd imagine a gigantic warehouse, right? With these um, metal for canning. We'd move the boxes, hundreds of big cartons full of metal from one side of the warehouse to the other side. And then the next day we would move it back and it was simply because they didn't want to pay us without us working. And so it was kind of a harassment type thing. So that's what they were, and so people were angry and stuff, and we said, you know what? We're not going to the warehouse today, not until we get better food and stuff. And Gene became the spokesperson. After that fishing season in the summer of 1973, the ACWA filed three class action lawsuits on behalf of Filipino and non-white workers in the Alaska canneries. I think we were part of the generation that at least started to raise questions at the company about why is it like this? Because many of our fathers and uncles and people before us, they just, took the, they just took the abuse and they just continued to work because they had no choice but to do that. We felt we had a choice. And so we started making some noise about that, uh, started documenting a lot of what was going on. We need to learn how to organize. So I went to Alaska early on, freezing my butt off, actually crying. So what the hell am I doing here? It's so cold, right? And, uh, and learning how to organize union. And when I came back, uh, um, the uh, uh, younger people in the union were starting to talk about doing some sort of documentation of the discrimination up in Alaska to file lawsuits against the industry. The three lawsuits were filed against the largest canneries in Alaska, citing discrimination under Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. As the lawsuits slowly made their way through the courts, ACWA members, including Selma and Jean, found themselves blacklisted from obtaining work in the canneries, but they began to enlist others to help them in the struggle. I think it was Gene actually called me up and said, hey, you know, we've got this reform movement in the union and, and we thought we'd talk to you about it. And I had been involved in anti-war stuff with Vietnam and, and I, you know, I wanted to change the world, make it a better place. Part of going there really is to understand uh, what, trade unionism. What is it like to be a member of a union? What is it like to file grievance. What do we mean by being a shop steward? How do you uh, negotiate? So basic uh, trade union mechanics. And they also found an inspiration and model from the past, their mono forefathers, who had fought these battles decades before. Talked about like, um uh, you organize and experience it down in California. And then like, you know, I've read a lot of history of this union and that dates, you know, it starts off at about 1932 when the workers really put their foot down and decided that they're gonna, they're really gonna start organizing people. We Filipinos uh, open our eyes to how these white people are better conditioned in, in the working condition. The local Manos who had the closest ties to the work of the union uh, they really came from a generation uh, out of the uh, 30s and 40s and 50s and it was really uh, a blessing to have some of these uh, uh, monos still around who, uh, who remembered and uh, had the literature, had the pamphlets and leaflets and uh, had the stories to tell about uh, where they've come and what they've done. Our purpose, we Filipinos, were to unite together in order to fight a better condition of living. Most of those old timers were part of the, the Communist Party. And so they had no hesitancy about talking about their experiences and what they went through to be a political activists. Uh, and especially in a multiracial movement and, and sometimes the difficulties of that. Being able to sit down, have drinks with them and talk about their histories is really what influenced me a lot uh, and gave me my political uh, insight and 
and really that's where I got politicized was, was around being around them. Though the Monongs had created a roadmap the activists could follow, current inequities were not just created by the canneries. In the years following the rabid anti-communist era of the 1950s, the Union ousted its more radical early reformers. By the 1960s, the Union had become part of the problem, its leaders sanctioning bribes in exchange for jobs in Alaska. Something that was very paramount uh, to the reform of the, of the Union was is to abolish the, uh, the bribery and the favoritism that uh, was so rampant uh, <clears throat> for all the canneries. Uh, and it really did take a team to make sure that uh, everything was uh, was correct. Every, the records were, were, were kept in good order and that uh, people did get up to Alaska based off uh, seniority. As the second generation activists soon found out, trying to change a broken system threatened the old guard who controlled the union and profited from the bribes. Change would not come easily. There really wasn't a, a lot of thinking in our minds that this is going to be dangerous. I mean, we, we just thought that, you know, it's just another organizing thing. And we're going to take things on, and you know, um, you know, things were going to be on our side on this thing. You know, if we worked hard and we we did our organizing right as we were trained, and then I think as our movement got taken a lot more serious in the union, um, do uh, we began to see resistance occurring on the part of uh, Tony Barusa, who was the president of the union, and some of some of his. Uh, kind of um, supporters in the union starting to resist our efforts a little bit more, right? Tony Baruso had served as Local 37's president for six years. He had also made a failed run for the Washington State Legislature in 1970. As a high-profile community leader, he was also a staunch supporter of President Ferdinand Marcos, and he kept a photograph of them shaking hands in his office. Many from the community supported Marcos, a fellow Ilocos province native who rose to the highest position of power in the Philippines. Marcos' violation of democracy through martial law was a divisive point of conflict within the Seattle Filipino community. When I was growing up, most of the people, the Filipinos, were here pre-World War II. And there were post-World War II immigrants, and they're very different especially those who were from the area where my father was from, Ilocos, where Marcos was from. Geographic distance and hometown allegiances influenced attitudes towards the divisive and corrupt Philippines president. Kind of thought, he's just a nice boy. You know, he's doing the right thing. Because of that regional connection, uh, plus they hadn't, I think, lived in the Philippines for a long time, even though they'd go back to visit. And then you have the post-World War people that were seeing what he was doing to their country and they were more closely aligned to it. Some people were perceived as supporting Marcos and were just labeled as just evil people. And they're going, wait a minute, we've been here for all this time and we've built up the community centers and all of this that you guys, the latecomers are coming now and trying to take over. And because we think we're loyal, like Filipino Americans, you're attacking us. And these other people are going, but you're supporting a man that's suppressing our country. This sharp tension played into the battles of the anti-Marcos work, the lawsuits, and the union reform movement. The young activists were all but frozen out of the union by the old guard Marcos supporters. We realized that it was going to take more of a movement within the union to, to make it happen. So we created a, uh, what we called a rank and file movement, which was Something that we had looked at historically within the union, there had been at one point in time another rank and file movement. So we kind of used that as our model and talked to some of the old timers about how they did it and how they created it and how it was effective or not effective and used some lessons from them uh, and, and recreated what we called a rank and file movement. After several unsuccessful attempts at electing reform candidates for the Local 37's executive board, the young rank-and-file committee members nearly swept the ballot in 1980, with Silme elected secretary-treasurer and Jean winning the key position of dispatcher. Only Baruso remained from the old leadership. And so as we were doing the organizing and, and, and through the reform movement all the way up until um, the ILWU convention uh, in Hawaii, we, we thought nothing of the real danger of this. I mean, we were young and brash and we had our ideas about what needs to get done, so we just went 
gangbusters forward. And um, we just uh, did what we needed to do. Before attending the International Longshoremen's and Warehousemen's Union Convention in Hawaii, Jean traveled to the Philippines to meet with family members and anti-Marcos leaders, including the Kilosang Mayo Uno, or KMU, the Federation of Anti-Marcos Trade Unions. Jean arrived at the convention determined to get ILWU support for the Philippines labor movement. You know, the ILWU itself has a very progressive, rich history. And this was probably the only time that the ILWU had not taken a position against a dictator. And so it was very significant that Jean brought back that not only greetings from the KMU and that the Local 37 brought this resolution to the International. The vote on the resolution to send an ILWU team to the Philippines to investigate repression of the labor movement was initially split due to opposition from Baruso and other Marcos supporters. But it eventually passed, setting in motion a challenge against the Marcos dictatorship. The start of the fishing season was right on the heels of the convention. The young activists held the keys to running a fair dispatch, and Jean was determined to eliminate bribes from the process. Emboldened by the victory in Hawaii, Jean and Selma continued their outspoken opposition to Marcos, despite the growing danger to their lives. When he came, like when he came back from the Philippines, he was only there. I, I had to leave to Alaska because I went up early, way earlier than, than the cannery crews to get things ready. So I only got to see him for about a week. And so he had told me, because um, he used my truck a lot here and there, and so he'd say, if you notice somebody following you, and I go, what? And he'd say, yeah, just be aware, you know. When Salmi actually came to me and um, the executive board and said, um, there, we need to buy life insurance. I was driving Salmi's car because my car had broken down. I was living on Beacon Hill. And um, I've noticed that going back and forth to school, I, there was a um, car following me. And um, I told Salmi, somebody's following you. And he started laughing. And nobody believed me, right? And I was like, no, there is somebody following you, Salmi. But I remember asking him, is, is this really dangerous? Do you need to come home? And he says, no, no. I mean, they're, they're angry, but they're, he thought he had it under control. And the feeling was, is, yeah, it's dangerous, but it's worth doing. And if not him, then somebody's going to have to do it. And it's just as dangerous for them. Gene stood fast in his refusal to take bribes and allow unfair favoritism. Tony Dictado, leader of the Tulisan, a Filipino street gang who controlled gambling in the Union, was enraged because he was unable to get his gang members dispatched up to Alaska for the coming season. Baruso also grew increasingly upset by the actions of Gene, Silmi, and the other young rank-and-file reformers. I think the week before um, uh, the murders, Tony Dictato was sort of a known, he was a known gangster to us. He was in the office talking to Baruso. They went in and shut the door. You could see, because he had a glass door, so you could see him in there, yeah, uh, you know, talking. Um, so he was around a lot that last week. He had made threats against Gene about the Dillingham dispatch that he said he was going to kill Gene. I just think we didn't really uh, think that, that would, you know, there's a lot of that kind of bravado to talk that sometimes you just sort of put into a category. You just kind of go, well, that's just, you know, braggadocio or whatever. And, but yeah, I think it was shocking. Didn't think it would really happen. I had gone to work, I went to pick up the girls and was driving home. And the funny thing is I almost went by the hall and I didn't, I decided to go home. So I went home and I made dinner because uh, we were supposed to have a meeting that night. And so the meeting was set for, I think four o'clock or 4.15 or something like that. Well, I was running late from work and I was caught in traffic. 
So I was going down there, and as I was approaching the Union Hall on the right, um, there were, it was cordoned off, and there were uh, police cars and fire trucks there. Chris is watching the news, and he says, uh, and he was as white as a ghost, he says, something happened at the Union. He goes, there's something they said that there's a shooting at the Union and stuff. And I go, what? I go, no, it can't be. And I walked up to the Union Hall because people were standing around the Union Hall. And I was met by a police officer standing outside saying, oh, you can't go in here. There was a shooting in here. I said, shooting? He said, yes. Uh, and uh, just, um, two people got shot. And um, we think it might be a, a gang thing. And one person is taken to the hospital. Gene and Selmy were alone in the Union Hall when two men entered the building. One pulled a 45 caliber MAC-10 automatic pistol with a silencer and began firing. Gene was killed instantly. But Selmy survived, despite being shot four times. He made it out to the alley behind the Union Hall, where he was spotted by a cook from the restaurant across the street. An ambulance transported Selmy to Harborview Medical Center. So I came in and I called the hall and nobody answered. And I thought, oh, okay, he's on his way home. And so I finished dinner, and uh, then John Foz called me, I think. We, we received a phone call, I forget from who. It was a, a phone call that said that uh, Gene and Selmy had been shot, and uh, we did not know uh, their condition. And he said, are you at home? And I said, yeah, and he goes, Elaine and I are gonna come by for a minute. I was like, oh, okay. I go, well, you know, we're just about to have dinner. I'm waiting for Selmy. I have a meeting. And he's like, well, we just need to come by for a minute. I'm like, okay. So they come in, and it was John and Elaine and Sherry Wu. Yeah. Yeah. And I opened the door, and I could just tell. Sherry immediately took the kids aside, and I was like, and then they go, Gene and Selmy have been shot. I'm like, what? <laughs> I mean, I was just so, I had no, I didn't know what they were talking about. And then I think they took the kids somewhere and they took me to the hospital. At that point, we went down to uh, pick up my mom because they said that Selmy and Gene had been shot and I thought, that they were going to be really strong and that they would be alive, but we did not know that Jean had died instantly. And then Selmy we went to pick up my mom and she said, we're going to go to the hospital. We actually um, went to see Selmy when he was um, in surgery. And we knew that Selmy wasn't going to make it. He had already had a severe um, um, trauma. Um, to all his internal organs and we he they were already doing their last CPR on him but he lasted as long as to at least tell you know Terry and my mom you know who was involved before he was taken to the hospital Silmi was able to identify the shooters to the emergency crews that had arrived on the scene Ben Guloy and Jimmy Ramil who were both members of the Tulisan street gang. I just couldn't believe it. I mean, uh, basically the friend who called just said Gina died and, and Selmy was in the hospital. I mean, it was that short. It was like that. I was just uh, pretty much just devastated. Selmy went through three surgeries, regaining consciousness a number of times, but his heart finally stopped and he died about 24 hours after he had been shot. Well, you know, this, this was the first time that I ever cried in, in my life since I left the Philippines. In, in the war in Vietnam, I never cried. I didn't have any feelings at all. I had to cut that off. But this was different because this here was a person that was, that was very close to me. He was like a brother. And, uh, and I loved him a lot, you know. And to lose something like that, it just kind of just blew me away. I, I really wanted revenge. And one of the decisions that we had to make was we had to go back into the Union Hall the next day to continue that work. And so uh, that's where we decided to go in as a team. So it was Emily, myself, uh, Alonzo, um, John Foz, and Terry. 
decided to go in the next day. And we went in the next morning. What I think affect me most is how we responded to the situation. Uh, I don't think I would be able to respond to the murders without the other people. Because uh, it was very scary. I, I'm not sure if it was scared, but we just went in there and we charged in there and said, um, and the blood wasn't even dried yet. And, you know, um, we we're going to take over this. We we're going to continue to work. Bottom line is this. Those are the people who had to actually go back in and uh, turn the key and open up the union and get ready for the next dispatch, right? We really actually ran a dispatch, uh, a fair dispatch, uh, while, this, while the ditch badger had just been killed. You know, so uh, the incredible heroism on that part. But I would say that it was the collective strength because uh, I often muse on the fact that, um, you know, no one ever sets out to be, a, real heroes never set out to be heroes. You're just trying to do what's right and then circumstance puts something in front of you. And, then, uh, and so ordinary people wind up doing extraordinary things. Do still do the continue doing the work in Local 37, still continue the work in KDP, da da da. And for me, I was kind of disoriented. So, what do we do? You know, what, what's going on? And if it wasn't for the organization's leadership uh, and the determination to, to seek justice by everyone, it's what kept us going. You know, uh, I know it kept me going. Despite their shock at the murder of their friends and fears about their own personal safety, the rank and file committee members forged ahead with union reform efforts. Meanwhile, another group of activists and community supporters focused on seeking justice for Jean and Silmi. Committee for Justice was formed immediately after the murders. Um, you know, um, yeah, everyone knew that this was m more than a random. Uh, killing and it was more than union reform. Domingo's younger sister, who was elected to his union job after the killing, believes there may be a second motive for the murders. Union reform, but also political opposition to President Marcos. Were they more executions than random murders or gang war violence? I think, I think there could be a possibility. But I think our goal is to really find the truth. You know, who killed Selmy and Jin and why? And so what we did is really look at you know, the bits and pieces, you know, how it happened, why it happened, who are the people that we think, you know, is involved. Silmi's sister, Cindy Domingo, became the national chair of the Committee for Justice for Domingo and Viernes, an organization that led the effort to link the murders with perpetrators that they believed went far beyond the gunmen. We went up against some incredible power. Uh, one is the, you know, the power of the, um, the, the gangs, uh, nothing to sneeze at, by the way. Uh, so these were the actual guys who pulled the trigger, and they were uh, dangerous. That will not preclude any additional discovery. The two gunmen, Jimmy Ramil and Ben Gouloy, were arrested and convicted of first-degree murder within four months of the killings. These trials won't bring back Salmi and Jean, and it's a loss that it's going to take a long time to get over. But. We're going to continue finding out who's responsible for Salmi and Jean's murder, and it's not going to stop here. A few months later, Tulisan gang leader Tony Dictato was found guilty of directing the shootings. The murder weapon was found discarded in a public park garbage can. It was registered to Tony Baruso. Baruso was arrested, but he claimed the gun had been stolen. When he was called to the witness stand at the trials of Ramil, Guloy, and Dictato, Baruso refused to answer questions 
invoking his Fifth Amendment right to avoid self-incrimination 140 times. The Committee for Justice continued to search for links to others who might have ordered the murders, including Ferdinand Marcos. It's significant that when they went to the convention that um, they put a resolution for an investigation team to go to the Philippines and the impact of having a large organization like the International Longshoremen's and Warehousemen's Union to investigate something like that would have, you know, results for that country. As we went after the perpetrators, uh, it got very complex, and so Baruso had two roles, one as the kingpin for the corruption in the Union, and one as the ally of the Marcos dictatorship. Pursuit of Tony Baruso and Ferdinand Marcos pressed on for years. What un got uncovered in the course of the um, justice effort was that the Marcos government uh, was um, in touch with Baruso and that Baruso more or less um, had been outmaneuvered by the reform effort. So he, then he has uh, ties to the Marcos regime and they're really mad at a resolution on uh, Gene and Selmy uh, and the union pushed through at the ILWU convention to uh, basically um, um, in solidarity with the Filipino workers movement that was being suppressed under Marcos. So that's the confluence of things that came together and, uh, and, uh, and that's the thing that we didn't see coming. Because eventually the legal side became the prominent side when we knew that Baruso was part of the conspiracy and uh, we wanted to file the civil suits, right? in court um, against the Marcos regime and family. That was really their mistake, that you can't just silence two, two men who were leading the group, the, the opposition. Um, it, they underestimated the organizing and the collective that was created through those years. A couple of key people right on the front line said, basically to Baruso, okay, now you're really in trouble. You think you were in trouble before. You have not seen anything yet. In 1989, after years of steadfast investigation, a wrongful death civil suit against the Marcos regime went to trial. Marcos had since fled to Hawaii after his regime collapsed in 1986. He died just months before the trial commenced. Evidence showed that a sum of $15,000 was paid out from the Marcos Allied Slush Fund to Tony Baruso for a special security project right before the murders. Baruso, called to testify, once again invoked the Fifth Amendment 75 times. When the case was uh, you know, filed is that who are we to file to charge against president of the you know, country, which it never been done. And so I think for us it was it's it was really just a shock. I mean, I was shocked because I like, wow, that actually, as an American citizen, you can actually do this. And I think it was a shock for the community that, as I said, it split it up because it's just like they we, nobody thought that it can happen, you know. And more or so that we really challenge the president of the Philippines and win. On December 15, 1989, a federal jury found Ferdinand Marcos liable for the murders of Jean Viernes and Silmi Domingo. And it's still a precedent in law schools. So when you go to law school, they use this case, say, here's a case where um, a foreign government was held liable for the murder of U.S. citizens. Armed with the evidence of the $15,000 payment, Tony Baruso was charged with murder and brought to trial. He was convicted on March 8, 1991, almost 10 years after Silmi and Jean were murdered. Given a life sentence without the possibility of parole, Baruso died in prison at the age of 80 in 2008. <music> 1991 proved to be a significant year. Not only was Baruso finally brought to justice, but Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1991 to strengthen and improve federal civil rights law and to provide for damages in cases of intentional employment discrimination. 
This act was a response to a Supreme Court ruling which invalidated the last of the ACWA class action lawsuits that were initiated in the 1970s. In a strike against the supporters of the Civil Rights Bill, Senator Frank Murkowski of Alaska amended it to exempt specifically the Wards Cove cannery, which had been named in the original lawsuits. It was a blow to a legal effort that had lasted 27 years. Naturally, I was disappointed in the outcome of the Wards Cove case. I think anyone in my shoes would be. Um, it was a time when the whole civil rights area was changing, uh, and um, that was sort of certainly part of the explanation for how things came out. The legacy of the lawsuits was initially to make people aware uh, that there were laws prohibiting a lot of the discrimination that people could see, uh, maybe shift people's their attitudes a little bit so that uh, they didn't simply see and comment on and accept the discrimination, but tried to do something about it. Many of the canneries that had been accused of discrimination had gone out of business by the time the class action lawsuits were finally settled. But the efforts of Gene, Silmi, and others had paid off nonetheless. Having experienced a little bit of what they saw, because it was starting to get better, it was changing, and, but it was still there to some extent, but you could tell that it was changing. Um, and I still could see some of the, some of the problems that were there. And, and I got to see it change, so I knew what they were doing was working. You know, after, after all of that work they did, you, you could, uh, if you were still going to Alaska, you could see the difference in, in the treatment we were getting, the housing, the food. I mean, things actually changed. The period after the murders was a changing time for the salmon canning industry and the local 37. The second generation activists had reformed the union, and began steering it in a democratic, progressive direction. But by then, the industry had switched from canning to fresh frozen processing. With jobs beginning to vanish, the union decided to sell the building that they had owned since 1947 and where Gene and Selmy were murdered. They merged to become Region 37 within the Inland Boatmen's Union, the Marine Division of the ILWU. Terry Mast was elected the National Secretary Treasurer of the IBU, a position she still holds today. For me, it's still being part of a movement. I think the labor movement is kind of the only hope for the working class in this country. Uh, so I enjoy doing that. And I think it's, um, it's, it's personally rewarding to me. And it's, you know, it's, uh, I, think, I, th I think at this point, I also bring something to the table. Thank you. And I'm Terry Mass, the National Secretary Treasurer of the Inland Boatman's Union. It's been over 30 years since Jean and Silmi were murdered, and their friends and allies continue to reflect on and celebrate their lives and influence. The legacy of Jean and Silmi runs deep. Well, I think their legacy, one, was that they did bridge the gap. They did bridge the the history from before to present uh, and kept it going you know they they kept that movement that was started back then uh, brought it to present and, and we've kept it going um, so I think that's one I think the other is that they did create change in the industry who knows what would have happened without these murders I mean if 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 these murders and the reform of the union had not happened um, it's uh, it's hard to say what where the Canary Workers Union would be. It's hard to say where both the ILWU and the IBU would be, to be honest, because it injected in some sense uh, and enlivened a whole sort of international view of, of the labor movement in a way that, uh, you know, it takes, it took their blood. For me now, it's that actually still operates, that uh, collectively, if we put things together, we can work things out and we can make change. You know, change is about uh, disliking your current condition, having a vision, 
uh, taking the first step and overcoming resistance, right? So all those things uh, somewhat, I think, for me, is the legacy of what Jean and Sami represent. Not a day I don't think about those two. I just think about what they'd be doing right now, what they would think about the world we live in. Well, like I say, he was he was my role model, my my uh, my my beacon in life. You know, that I was just so proud of him. Sorry. With both those guys, I mean, they lived life. I think as far as to the fullest, they 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 never looked back, and they really, both of them, I they had one thing in common with them. They always gave. They never looked to take anything from anybody. It was always something that they would, I hate to use the old common cliche, but they give you the shirt off their back. Gene's memory is uh, like, a, he throws a big shadow. It's like a curse, right? I kind of think sometimes he was killed when we were 29, when you're a young man. You have the energy, and you're strong, and you're committed, and when you're an old man, <laughs> sometimes you just want to sit on the couch, you know, <laughs> and you don't want to fight with them, and you don't want, but the standard is there, and so I think, you know, what do I do? You know, do I not, not believe who we were, who we are? Selmy and Jean have not been forgotten their lives, work, and sacrifice continue to inspire the next generation. After my first year of college, I went to the AFL-CIO three-day organizing institute and you know, started getting trained to be a union organizer at 18 years old. Through that process, I sort of started understanding my life and my experiences and understanding what my parents' lives were about and what their work was about. And, um, you know, I think I was just really instilled with this idea about needing to do work that changed the world. I, there's, a, there's a part of me that is from Wapato, um, born and raised here, that the outside world is kind of scary. And then when I get into the outside world, like I'm a proponent for, I feel like I'm kind of a proponent for speaking the truth. And I think what Uncle Gene has inspired in me is to always seek the truth. You don't necessarily need to convince other people of the truth, but always look deeply at issues, find out what is my truth in these issues and move, move towards that truth. I think that's what he's, what he's inspired in me. What I remember mostly about them doesn't have to do with politics or the lawsuits. It has to do with there are certain people that are just your friends. Uh, I would have trusted either one of those people with my life. Thank you.